पृथिवी शांतिरंतरिक्ष गांतिशांतिश शांतिरवांतर दिशा शांतिरग्निशाते वायु शांतिरादित्य शांति चंद्रमा शांतिर्नक्षत्राणी शांतिराप शांतिरोषदय शांतिर्वनस्पत शांतिर्गौशातिरजा शांतिरश्वशातिषाती ब्रह्मशातिर्ब्राह्मण शांति शातिरव शाति शातिर्मे अस्तु शांति मे दे बी पीस ऑन अर्थ एंड इन द स्काय मे दे बी पीस इन द वॉटर एंड इन ऑल डिरेक्शन्स मे दे बी पीस इन द प्लांट्स इन द ट्रीज एंड इन एनिमल्स May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarve tra sukhina santo, sarve santo niramaya ha, sarve bhadrani pasyanto, ma kashchit dukha bhag bhavet, sarvas tarato durgani. सर्वो भद्राणी पश्यतो सर्वसद्बुद्धिमाप्नोत्र नंद मे ऑल बी हैप्पी एंड हेल्थी मे ऑल सी वॉट इज गुड एंड मे नो वन एक्सपीरियंस मेजरी मे ऑल ओवरकम देर ऑब्स्टिकल्स एंड अक्वायर गुड टेंडेंसीज मे पीपल एवरीवेर फाइन जॉय एंड फुलफिलमेंट Let us now spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. as we breathe in let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love strength and compassion and as we breathe out let us release all the stress anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind let us practice this way for a while Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in every one, the divine presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a divine name. Let us now spend some time dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts.
Om. Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Aviravir Mahedhi Rudrayate Dakshinam Mukham Tenamam Pahinityam May the Divine lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the Divine Consciousness fill our hearts and protect us. Welcome. Uh, as we begin a uh, study of a, a, a new text uh, now, uh, to study well, a new text for our study, but the text itself is not new. Uh, it's called Narada Bhakti Sutras. Many of you have already gotten copies of it. So what I will do today is uh, let's have a brief introduction to the text and the author of this book. Um, and then beginning next week, we will begin the study of the text itself. So Narada Bhakti Sutra. So Sutra, uh, I would like to say a few words about Sutra. The religious literature comes in, in many different forms. Um, there is clearly the, the text in, in prose, uh, but there is also considerable amount of religious literature is in poetry. There is another class of literature within the religious field uh, which is called the, the Sutra literature. Now Sutra, one of the literal meanings of Sutra is, is a thread and just as in a garland, a thread connects all the flowers in a garland, is the kind of a linking, something that links everything. Uh, in the same way, um, a sutra, a sutra literature threads together all the key or important insights of the topic that it addresses. There is one very ancient Sanskrit verse which describes the characteristics of Sutra in a very beautiful way. The Sanskrit goes like this, Alpaksharam asandigtham saravat vishvato mukham astobham anavadyancha sutram sutra vido viduhu. What qualifies to be a Sutra? Sutra English, we usually translate sutra as aphorism. It's usually very short sayings, as, as brief a statement as possible. Um, so the, it needs to fulfill all these conditions. Alpaksharam, first of all, it has to be as brief as it is possible. They say that, um, sometimes jokingly they say that, these writers of this sutra, if they can find a way to reduce even one syllable from a sutra, they'll have a big celebration at home. The idea is it can be condensed, it, it is condensed to such an extent that no one should be able to condense it any further. So it's really very cryptic in that sense. That's alpaksharam. Alpa means little, akshara, as few words as possible. Asandigtham. Now, sometimes if you put things very concisely, then there's always can be uh, uh, some ambiguity. But do you mean this or do you mean that? So, at least from the author's view, it should be concise, but it should not be ambiguous. That it should have something definite to say, but it should be very briefly stated. 
Sarvat Vishwato Mukham. Vishwato Mukham means it should comprise, it should express a universal truth, a truth that can be verified, a truth that can that is um, repeatable, irrespective of place and time. So it's a vast dope, Vishwato Mukham, but Saravat. Saravat means in essence. Sara is the essence. So the aphorism expresses the essence of a universal truth. And by universal I mean a truth that is not bound by place and time. What today we might say is scientific truth. Although, although to be, to kind of get it right, because we are now considering vast spaces, not simply limited to our planet or our galaxy. Um, a lot of the scientific truths which we can say are, are um, universal or repeatable, many of them apply only to the planet Earth. A lot of these truths may not hold in some other galaxy at some other time. There's no other way to verify it or that also. But, but the truths that are, that are being described here um, are not bound by any physical limit or time. Astobham. Astobham means, um, one of the ways the word uh, astobham can be um, described is that no letter or word in that sutra can be substituted by anything else. No one will be able to find or should be able to find a better way of descri describing it, a better way of substituting something else for it. That means it must be really perfect. That's what the final word says. Anavadyam. Anavadyam means it should be free from error, free from any defect. So you can see it's a tall order. For something to be recognized as an aphorism, recognized by the orthodoxy, recognized as a genuine part of a sutra literature, it must be brief, it must be unambiguous, it must express the essence of a universal truth, um, it should be unsubstitutable. I don't even know whether there is of such a word. Um, and anavadyam, that is, it should be free from error. Such are the characteristics of a sutra. And so this book that we are going to study um, is, is, belongs to that literature, sutra literature. Now it's bhakti sutras. So these sutras deal with, with bhakti. Now, as many of you are already familiar, the pathways to spiritual life can be categorized in many different ways. Uh, and these terms are, are well known for those who study Eastern traditions, especially Vedanta. There is jnana, knowledge, there is bhakti, uh, and so on. One of the great achievements of Swami Vivekananda, a great contribution, in fact, was to present a new way of categorizing all spiritual practices. The easiest way, of course, as some of us might want to do, is to categorize them just based on Either the, we can say, well, these are Eastern practices as opposed to Western practices. Um, we could categorize them based on religion. We could say these are Hindu practices, they are Christian practices, or Muslim practices, or Buddhist practices. These are different ways of categorizing what are essentially spiritual practices. What Swami Vivekananda did was a little different. And what he did was this that no matter which part of the world we come from, no matter which is the primary spiritual tradition we follow, no matter which point in history, which point in history we belong to, irrespective of all of that, as long as we are living beings, and specifically since we are only familiar with the inner workings of the species to which you and I belong, so human beings, as human beings, our primary instrument in any spiritual practice is the mind. Apart from the different culture, religion, language, all those differences, but we are all using our mind. And what Vivekananda did was to 
say what are the basic functions that any human mind carries out? What are the different powers a mind has? And it's possible to say that the mind has essentially three basic powers. One is the power of reasoning. The second is the power of emotions and feelings. And third is the will power, the power of the will. Ideally speaking, <clears throat> although all of these three powers are present in every mind, uh, they are not equally manifest, equally developed in every mind. And which is why we see the differences between people. There are some people we say, oh, this person is very emotional, or this person is very analytical, is very, uh, very rational. And sometimes we say this person is, is got a tremendous willpower. Now, when we say someone is very uh, rational, that doesn't mean that emotions are totally absent in that person, or that person doesn't have any power of the will. It only means that a certain aspect of the mind is dominant, while the other are, are kind of in the background. Now, based on this, Swami Vivekananda said, that all spiritual practices which predominantly employ the power of reasoning can come under the category of Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge. And as I said, never make the mistake of thinking that the path of knowledge only means reasoning. Sure, that's the dominant thing, but there is scope for even emotions and feelings there. There is a scope for willpower there. Now, all spiritual practices which predominantly use the power of emotions and feelings, those come under the category of Bhakti Yoga, the path of devotion. All spiritual practices which use the power of the will in the external world through the work that we do, that comes under the category of Karma Yoga, the path of selfless work. And all spiritual practices which use, predominantly use the power of the will to deal with the internal world, with the functioning of the mind, that comes under the path of Raja Yoga, the path of contemplation. Now what all of these paths do, what all of these, each of these paths is the yoga, <clears throat> meaning each of these paths can connect me to the true source of my being, connect the apparently limited me with the truly infinite me. All of these three powers of the mind at present somehow seem to have become contaminated. By contaminated I mean that they manifest in ways which take me more away from myself. So I can use reasoning, I can use my emotions and feelings, I can use my willpower but I may be using it in ways which instead of it taking me back to my true self, in fact is taking me away from it. And so the first thing and the most important thing that all of these yogas do is a purification of these powers. So Jnana Yoga purifies the power of reasoning. Now, what do we mean by purifying the power of reasoning? It's like this. Uh, Think about it this way, um, yeah, in any, um, say any, any, any court case, when there is a legal dispute, there are lawyers on both sides, with the prosecution there is the defense, and essentially they have the same set of evidence to work on. And both try to create a narrative around the evidence that's available and clearly both are saying two opposite things. That's why they're on the opposite sides. So it's possible to apply reasoning, apply logic um, in order to prove whatever it is that one wants to prove. That's why it's very unfair, but some people uh, very um, sometimes say lawyers are liars. 
Now that's I, I, that's very unfair. I recognize, but but what what the thing is the thing is this. It it has not meant to be taken literally. What it means is the power of reasoning. If it's not employed in the way it can be or should be employed, at least from a spiritual standpoint, can be used to take me away from truth. But it can also bring me towards truth, depending on how I use it. Same thing with regard to the power of emotions and feeling. Emotions and feelings are tremendous power within us. But we know the same power of feelings, if it's not controlled, purified, manipulated in a in a positive way, it can take me astray. Uh, I can use my feelings. My feelings can take me towards things in life that, instead of bringing me joy, can in fact bring me more pain and suffering. And so again, so what the spiritual practice can do is purify those feelings. You know, what it means is that it will make my bring clarity to my mind, so I know how to use this power of the feelings responsibly. how to use the power of reasoning responsibly how to use the power of the will responsibly some of the most terrible things that have happened in life um done by people who had tremendous will power even if you want to go and hurt people destroy people um you need will power it it's not something that can be done by weak minded people again a will power employed in a negative way can bring about a lot of destruction i mean one of the problems with now we say terrorism of people who are really doing so much harm in some respects many of them have a strong will power unfortunately that will power is is producing a lot of harm a lot of pain around so wonderful as the will power is we must also be conscious of where that power is directed and so purification of that power is what yoga does so yoga's primary function is purifying the powers of the mind gnana yoga purifies the power of reasoning bhakti yoga purifies our emotions and feelings raja yoga and karma yoga purify and strengthen our will power so that's about sutra that's about bhakti um a lot of the the upanishads primarily are deal with the path of knowledge but as swami vivekananda often pointed out that some of the most the loftiest ideal of uh, ideas of bhakti can also be found there so don't uh, be under the impression that upanishad means all very knowledge and there is no nothing about devotion there so so we have to be careful of only in the gita that we just completed uh, studying i think it probably took 4 years for for it to finish the gita is a, is a wonderful text it really has a confluence of all of these yogas in fact as you know each of the chapter in the gita is called a yoga so we find a great harmony uh, of karma yoga bhakti yoga dhyana yoga and raj yoga in the gita text and that's because the teacher of the gita krishna himself embodies a, a a wonderful harmony of all of these four yogas so while any of these yogas is capable of taking us to enlightenment the ideal that shri ramakrishna swami vivekananda and holy mother have put before us is to consciously try to develop a, a all of these powers within us um and bring them into harmony as much as possible in spite of that it possible that one or the other of these powers may still be dominant within us and that's okay which is why we might be attracted to any one of these yogas more than to others which is also okay uh but it's also helpful not to become kind of one sided to to allow the flowering of all these different parts of the mind uh, which is one of the um 
reasons, I thought it will be helpful to all of us who are a part of this uh, study group to, to focus for the next uh, few weeks on this bhakti text. And this is a relatively short text. It has 84 aphorisms, 84 sutras. Um, and of course, sutra themselves are small, so this is actually the whole of this text can come only within a few pages. The rest is all really a commentary. Now, a little bit about the author um, of this uh, book. Now, Narada is a, is a well-known well -known, uh, figure in, uh, in Vedantic history and tradition. In fact, he, he pops up pretty much everywhere, which has raised questions in the mind of rational-minded people. Is it really a one person, or these are like different people, all having the name Narada? It doesn't really matter. But, but we find um, references to him in the Vedas, which is the oldest, historically known, the oldest extant uh, literature. We find him appearing in the, um, in, uh, the, the two great epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In fact, we read that it was he who inspired Valmiki, the author of the, the most ancient version of Ramayana. He inspired him to write the, Maha, the, the Ramayana. And Narada was also the inspiration to Vyasa to, to write the Mahabharata. So he is the inspiration to the authors of these two great epics as well. In fact, sometimes uh, it is said that um, uh, Vyasa, who had, who had edited and classified the Vedas into four books, he has done so much. He has, he has uh, written the Mahabharata, written the, all of these things doing, and he still, the story goes that he still felt, I still haven't had that peace of mind in spite of doing all this. It was then that Narada said, you should uh, write uh, about Sri Krishna. That's how Bhagavata then was then written. So there are a lot of stories connected with, uh, with Narada. Um, it is said that among the, the different versions of Narada's life that have come down to us, um, there are some common points emerge. Uh, one is that um, we don't know who his father was. He said to be the, he was said to be the son of a maid servant. So there was a maid uh, who worked in one home of one Brahmin, in a home of a Brahmin family. And it was there that Narada was born. And that family was, had used to invite saintly figures, wise people, holy men, um, scholars all the time. And, and they used to have these discussions and the whole, uh, probably looks like it was a very wealthy family to be able to uh, be a host to all these great ones. And, in, and we see that Narada is only f at the age of five. Um, his mom was a, the maid there. And so he got to help his mom and serve all these um, holy people who had gathered uh, in that master's family. And... Um, he used to sit and listen to the discussions amongst them. And, um, and that, so at a very young age, uh, these thoughts went uh, in him. And he took great interest in the ideas that he heard there. And then we read that his mother, um, one early morning when she was going towards the cow shed to milk the cows, it was very dark. And then she was bitten by a poisonous snake and died. Now, he didn't have any family other than his mother. So after his mother passed away, he really was orphaned in a complete literal sense of the term. And then we read that he just left home. He didn't have any, no more earthly ties. And then went and did a lot of austerities, immersing himself fully into spiritual practices. And therefore, the book that we are going to study is a, is a result of his own realizations. 
it's unique in some sense because unlike some of these ancient texts which um, sometimes um, go to disprove or, or dispute uh, contrary views or views of others or disprove them, uh, Narada doesn't do any of that. There are points here where he sometimes mentions the names of a few others whom he had heard, who had different views. He just mentions them and sometimes he shows where he agrees with them and oftentimes he just mentions, mentions his own view. Um, he, doesn't, he doesn't say that they are wrong. He doesn't say that only he is right. So we as readers of this text, as students, are, are, are given this freedom. We then can read and then decide what resonates with our own head and heart. So that, that's wonderful about it. Also, this text is not, how, how will I put this? It's not intellectual. Um, so it's not meant to be, to put a lot of um, um, a logic into it. Um, but that doesn't mean we are not going to discuss it. We will. Um, but, but that was not the intent of the author himself. So all that he is doing, that his own realizations as a result of his own practice, he's just putting them here. And then he just leaving it to us then to, to take them for what they are worth. A popular way Narada is seen uh, in, uh, in uh, the history in the Indian subcontinent as being uh, an, an intermediary, uh, someone who has enlightened and kind of became an intermediary between the heavenly world and the world in which we live. So he's he kind of a messenger of, of the gods, if you like. And um, they describe his name Narada in Sanskrit. They say, Naram Paramatma Vishayakam Jnanam Dadati Iti Naradaha. One way the, the term Naram can be understood is all knowledge related to that highest reality, knowledge related to God. So one who is able to share that highest knowledge so is Narada. So Narada, even the literal meaning of the term Narada is one who shares the knowledge of that highest truth. Now that's what a divine sage, the, the term that gets often used for Narada in Sanskrit is Devarshi, Deva plus Rishi. Deva means one who has attained to that exalted celestial stage and Rishi means who is a sage. So he is a combination of both, the celestial being and a, a sage, a divine sage. Now, there is also a not so exalted explanation of his, the, the, the meaning of his name. In Sanskrit it say, Naram Narasamuham Kalahena Dyati Khandayati Iti. So here in this uh, way, when his name is explained, Narada is seen as someone who, who um, uh, instigates trouble. Who, 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 and, that, and that's the kind of a popular way we read Narada and many of these stories in, in Indian mythology. That when everything seems to be going well and when Narada appears on the scene in many of these old stories, people are like, oh no, there's going to be some trouble. And so apparently, yes, it does look like he, he does uh, some mischievous things. Not just mischief, actually it might seem as if he, he really starts a problem. He creates a problem where there seem to be none. Now that might seem to be a pretty villainous uh, position to be in. Except, except, while it might really seem to be something terrible that he is doing. But if you kind of follow the story along, you will see that later on, 
that that particular trouble, that particular quarrel, or that particular mess was actually needed to bring about a good end. And so, so what? So he somehow is um, um, freed from that being like really a, a villainous character. When we see in retrospect, you look back at what did his actions ultimately achieve, and we see that. Well, actually, it did really something very good. But while he's doing them, you don't really um, recognize it. To some extent, I would imagine um, many parents and teachers kind of fit that, that role of a Narada. Sometimes when you um, scold your children or your students for um, they, if they're not studying enough, if they're not doing what ought to be done, um, and sometimes um, you need to employ. You, you could be angry. You could you could do different strategies to to do it. And sometimes one, especially parents of teenagers, might see that your teenagers might very well see their parents as a villainous character. At least on at least on some occasions, when they wanted to do something and they were not being allowed to do it. Uh, I read once, and one of the reasons why grandparents and grandchildren are often very friendly are very close because they both have a common enemy <laughs> <laughs> but we know parents know that even when you are angry with your child when you scold your child or when you admonish your child or when you uh, impose discipline or rules which are not liked by the children but your intention is not to hurt them your intention actually is to help them so while at that moment they may resent it um, years later when they look back as we all do we, we all were teenagers once so as we all when we look back at our own life and when we see that some of the good things that have happened in our life, uh, happened because of the discipline imposed upon us by our elders when we were young. A discipline that we may not have liked at that time. But if we were obedient enough to, to somehow accept it, even reluctantly, that had ultimately brought, out, uh, bring, brought some good result. And that's how really what Narada is. That's what Narada does. So it might seem to be something not very good at the time, but later on uh, we see that it really brings about good results. One of the other interesting things about Narada is that um, he's always pictured in, in, in uh, these ancient books as someone who is constantly on the move. He never can stay in one place. And, and um, in, in mythology, they sometimes uh, tell a story of why he is always on the move. And the story goes like this, that it says, at the beginning of creation, Daksha, he created 10,000 children in his wife Asikini, daughter of Panchajanya, with a view to populate the whole world. So it's a very different uh, way of genesis. It's not just the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. So, well, and this is not the only story. In, 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 in Indian mythology, there will be so many stories about how this creation started, which is actually a good thing. Um, if there were only one story, that would have seemed like, well, either take it or leave it, or like either that's how it happened or we don't know how it happened. But the fact that there are many, many stories describing how it happened, um, really supports the Vedantic view that if something never really happened, you have 10,000 ways of imagining how it could have happened. But if something had really happened, then that is only one way it could have happened. So the fact that there are many versions of it is actually a proof, according to Vedanta teachers, that it never really happened. Um, in any case, we are not really going there right now. So, here is this 10,000 children who were born um, in order to populate the earth. Now, these children um, were called 
Hariyashwas, that's the name, you don't have to remember it. And so they were sent on a pilgrimage to Nara and Saras in, in northern India, and they wanted to practice tapasya depending on, on the request of their father. The father said, well, if they, if they have some basic spiritual practice done, then they will be ideal, um, well, they are really starting this creation. So if it begins on a, in a very ideal way, the, 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 the earth as it gets populated will have a really a good, solid, stable basis. And so as they were doing these uh, practices there, uh, Narada shows up and um, he then takes it upon himself to instruct them. And he tells them, you see, um, all this practice that you're doing, that's great, but, but what you really need is to, to realize that ultimate truth. Because unless you realize that ultimate truth, you are never going to be happy in life. And so he kind of generated such tremendous um, renunciation in their heart that they all left everything and went and became monks. I mean, as you can see, the, the whole Daksha's plan got frustrated because he really wanted to populate the earth. And so, and then we read that he, this Daksha was infuriated and then he again procreated another 10,000 children. Well, they were, <laughs> no, numbers are like staggering. They say that um, all these big numbers in mythology, they say, oh, this person lived for 10,000 years. The numbers are not to be meant to be taken literally. When they give these numbers, it really means a big number. That's all. Uh, and so now, when these 10,000 10, children, they also went to the same place. Again, Narada instructed them. Even they left everything and went. And then this Daksha was really furious. And then he pronounced a curse. He told, because he thought, if this Narada stays in one place, he's going to go and give these teachings, and then it's never going to work. The only way to stop him from doing that is to always make him be on the move. So Daksha realized the value of Narada. He was this divine person. People like him are needed in the world. But um, so he can go about from place to place just inspiring people, but not staying long enough to make them change their mind totally from the world. And that's how then, well, this is one origin of the story, why Narada is always on the move. So I would just like to now conclude with, with reading from the Mahabharata. Um, in the Mahabharata, Bhishma is a very important character, and Yudhishthira was the eldest of the Pandavas. And Bhishma tells Yudhishthira, the Mahabharata, that Narada is an ideal person, is an ideal seeker. And he quotes Krishna. So what I'm going to read to you now is, what is Krishna's impression of Narada? And as, as I'll read it slowly, it's a little bit longer passage. But keep in mind that that description of Krishna about Narada is really a call to all of us. If we see ourselves as spiritual seekers, these are the kind of qualities we should aspire to. We may not have become perfected in all of these things at once. Some of these things we may not have. Some of these things we may have uh, in a smaller measure. But at least we know the ideal to strive for. So this is what Krishna thought about Narada. The deadly pride of having a high character never enters Narada's mind. Although he possesses sacred learning and noble conduct to perfection, he is honored everywhere because he possesses a full measure of spiritual dignity, glory, intellectual penetration, tact, humility, noble birth, austerity and heroism, and is free from discontent, anger, unsteadiness and procrastination. He deserves worship for he never deviates from his word, moved by lust or greed. High honor is paid to Narada everywhere because he is possessed of true self-knowledge, forbearance, tranquility, sense control, straightforwardness, truthfulness in speech, firm love for God, high spirit, holy wisdom, 
compassion, an undiluted mind, and shining manners. He can be easily accommodated, for he is gifted with dignity, sweet decorum, purity, and power of good speech, and has no envy. Certainly he is doing what is auspicious, and no sin stains him. He never finds pleasure in others' perils. He secures his ends with the aid of scriptural wisdom and knowledge of past events. Meek and equitable to all, he despises none. Hence also, he neither likes nor dislikes anyone specially. He is vastly learned and endowed with a wonderful gift of diverse speech and is never lazy or stubborn. He practices meditation not for securing esteem from others. He is leagues away from self-praise and speaks always softly. He observes the diverse behavior of men without despising anyone and is a master in the art of reconciling others, so he is honored everywhere. Though not attached to anyone, he is found to be deeply interested in all. He never keeps a doubt in suspense for long and is a good speaker. He is not regardless of other fates, but lives according to his own. He never wastes a moment and ever remains a master of himself. He has striven hard for perfection and has attained supreme wisdom. He is ever contented with self-realization and with great zeal he is ever absorbed in that realization. He is not without the sense of shame and is always open to instruction from others if that would add to his perfection. Never does he divulge the secrets of others, for his mind is always detached, intellect firm, and he is not affected, agreeably or disagreeably, by the obtainment or deprivation of objects of desire. Who would not make this paragon of virtue, efficient, holy, provident, and tactful, a beloved friend? So this is, well, Mahabharata has a hundred thousand verses. So when they praise someone, they don't, this is not the sutra form. This is the opposite of sutra form. But, but it gives us some idea about the kind of, and especially if this praise was coming from someone who is, who is uh, well, we can take this praise seriously because these are Krishna's own words. And we know that when Krishna said something, he meant it fully. So these are the, this is how the person, Narada, and it is his experiences, his realizations that are embodied in the text that we are going to study. So there are 84 sutras and we will begin the text proper uh, when we meet next Wednesday. So we have a few minutes. If you have any thoughts, ideas, questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Swamiji, some of us are very straight-laced and in our spiritual journey, many of the, the um, I think, images we have are of straight-laced um, forces and beings. But Narada, as you described, is quite mischievous or could be seen in that way. Is there anything we can learn from that or or I mean, ultimately it's his non-conforming nature also that causes an ultimate good outcome in many situations. So I'm wondering, is there anything we can ad ad adopt from the way he's lived and was really non-conforming in the way he was in, in, in our journey? What non-conforming in what sense? Well, from, from, from the layperson, you would look at Narada and think, as, as you said, that he often may cause some trouble. He stirs up the pot. Ultimately, it leads to some knowledge, but it, yeah. it on the short term looks... But the thing is this, I don't think Narada saw it as causing trouble. It's the person who was troubled saw it as this person is causing trouble. I mean, it's, again, going back to the example I gave, when, when parents say, mm, what is the word you, you ground, ground it, your children, yeah? And suppose you say, no, you're not going there, you're grounded, or you should be back at home before nine o'clock or something. Now, from the, uh, from the perspective of the children, from a son or a daughter would say, this is trouble. My parents are creating trouble. But parents don't see that they are creating trouble. 
they are just seeing like, well, this is something for the good of the person. So, when we speak about Narada, Narada didn't see that, well, I'm now out to make some trouble. Because he, being a sage, he could see ahead of time. He knew the intention, he knew the outcome. It's only others who saw it. So this is the outsider view that he is a troublemaker. So Swamiji, this book, this text, is actually written by Narada, or it's his words, is his realization. Like the words themselves are his, in the sense. I mean, why, why did he? So <laughs> what I'm trying to understand is why did he go to the extent of writing them in the sutra fashion? Well, why does anybody write in the sutra fashion? Not just yeah. Narada, because there is a lot of sutra literature. Well, I would imagine at least one possible answer, because uh, this sutra literature is pretty ancient, very old. And before we had um, any form of things to store information, the more concise you can make it, the easier it is to remember it. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes if you want to remember something, um, kind of note down at least the points, so that looking at that point, then you know what it stands for. So these sutras are a little bit like that. So, and that's why it is said, it's an essence of a something which is much vaster, much distant. So, if you see the extent of literature and devotion, it's huge. I mean, there is no end to it. And so, if someone can bring the, all the essentials of that, vast field of study and practice in, in concisely, uh, it will be easier for us to remember. I would think as that's, that seems to be one possible reason why even sutras are written. When there are yoga sutras, Patanjali's yoga sutra, there are uh, Brahma sutras of Vyasa. And so the sutra literature is, is pretty common. Mm -hmm. So just a quick follow-up, Swamiji. So the sutras are not meant for a spe specific audience or a type of student. It's, it's just concisely communicating universal truths. Yes. For anyone who would like to study. Who would like to study. In, um, and so that, that's why, and then it has. Because, because they are so concise, and the idea is this, if we are completely ready for the teaching, if our minds are completely tuned to Narada's mind, if are completely, we are ready for the path of devotion, we read these sutras, there will be no doubt, there will be no ambiguity. So now, the meaning of the sutras may not immediately become clear to us, um, partly because we are not ready for it, but partly also is because it's just so, so brief. It's like, it's like some of the Suppose you attend a meeting and you, there was some, the speaker makes some good points. And just to kind of, you were there at the meeting, so you remember it, you were presently there. And just for your own um, memory aid, you just note down two or three or four or five points on your piece of paper. And then when you go home and a friend asks you or someone at a family asks you, oh, you attended the lecture, what did the person say? And you can say, oh, well, here are these points. Now, that person is just going to see those four or five points. And they, in their mind, they won't be able to expand it. But you would, because you were present there. And that's why a lot of the sutra literature comes often with a commentary. Because then the commentators are the ones who are able to expand. Because they are, they are tuned to that same wavelength. And they are able to expand. And so we then study the commentary and then understand the, the wealth of insight and information that was kind of packed into that small thing. So that's the idea. Yeah. Swamiji, I forgot to ask you about whether you have a favorite verse from Bhagavad Gita, but now maybe to give us a taste, you have a favorite sutra out of the 80, 80 something. Because like, I have my you know, favorite one from Patanjali, and maybe there's something that just. Why don't we ask that question at the end of this text? Okay. So when we come towards the end, remember that. So you must I remember. Will. I'm not going to remember. I will. Okay. <laughs> the last sutra after doing it, 
And while we are studying it, all of you pay attention and try to figure out which of the sutras is like the most favorite or which is something that kind of immediately speaks to your heart. And then in the end, we'll have a survey and we'll find which sutra wins a gold medal. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the, we begin this, uh, the actual study of the text when we meet next Wednesday. Om Jananim Saratam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Mohor Mohor About the, the books themselves, uh, any edition of, uh, if you haven't got a copy yet, uh, any edition of Narada Bhakti Sutra should be fine. Um, so long as it should have the sutras in it, all 84 of them, uh, that's important. Um, but, but we have, we have uh, uh, there is one book by Swami Tyagi Sharanda called Narada Bhakti Sutras title. Uh, that's very good, but that, that also, that's tends to be a little bit technical with a lot of um, um, references and quotes. Often in, in uh, not all of those quotes have been translated. They are in the Devanagari script. So some of you uh, might find it helpful. But as I said, um, it's, it's, it's pretty technical. The book that I, uh, I would recommend is, is Narada Bhakti Sutra by Swami Bhuteshanandaji. So he was... Uh, the head of the order for many years, a very learned senior monk of the Ramakrishna order. And I find this um, explanation and commentary very straightforward, very direct, very accessible. And uh, this would be so, a book that I would recommend. So if you haven't had have a copy yet, you could either get this one or any other copy that would find. As I said, all that is needed is these 84 sutras should be there in, in a, whatever book you bring. This Sunday, uh, we will have Antar Yoga, and as we do every month, uh, we will have uh, spiritual readings by members, reflection, music, and also we'll celebrate the birthdays of everyone born in the month of September. So all of you are welcome. Anyone in September born here? Anyone? Oh, so you come on Sunday. Okay, very good. I will also try to come. <laughs> also try to come. <laughs> And next Wednesday, um, we'll continue. Uh, we'll continue this text, as I said. And our Tuesday and Saturday, Aarti and meditation will also have already resumed since yesterday, and we'll continue as usual. So you're welcome for all of these programs. Let's conclude now with a prayer. May the Divine Being, who is the Father in Heaven of the Christians, Holy One of the Jewish Faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Aura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, the Great Spirit of the Native Americans, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May we be granted strength freedom and clear understanding. May we learn to see God in our own hearts and in everyone around us. May God bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude, grace and love. Om Shanti 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 Peace, peace, peace be unto all.